So I think for me it was very interesting what I saw today from several aspects, you know, because I think when you will do your job and you will be in a certain way in the position to, uh, to work in this field, if you like, then uh, something like this will happen very often. It will happen very often that in a certain way in the intercultural context, and I'm, let's say, intercultural, specialized in intercultural philosophy. So I tell you a little bit about my CV, you know, which is not so usual, but I would not now like to have a preparation of a philosophical talk in the way, uh, which I seldom all uh, do anymore. So for me, this is also very usual, what I'm doing now that I start to speak with you as a philosophical talk. Because for sure, when we speak of dialogue, if we speak of Plato, you know, we speak of somebody. That is very interesting. I said it already once that we have a very strange history of philosophy. And you know, I was very long trained as a kind of hardcore philosopher. So I was at a very distinguished institution in Vienna at the University Heidelberg. I had my first job, then I was in Princeton. So I was really in the elite places. But at a certain place I saw that these things do not work what I've been taught in the intercultural context of intercultural philosophy. Why do they not work? I tell you, uh, after 20 years of experience, they first do not work because we take our own philosophical tradition usually. I, s I have to speak now as a philosopher, <laughs> and then I will tell you also. Uh, we do not, even in the high academic world, we do not really take the philosophical tradition of Europe seriously. We just interpret the philosophy from a picture of philosophy which we have mind. And from there then we say everybody has to do it this way. You can easily see it. For example, what I often say, you can as an academic philosopher even in Princeton or in Heidelberg or wherever you want to be, I am allowed to write a book on Plato. Yeah? And I have to respect the standards of what today uh, philosophy means. Yeah? I have to do, uh, find certain arguments, etc. I have to write in a certain style. But Plato was a theater maker yeah? at the beginning. He was no philosopher, you know. He was a theater maker and then he met Socrates and suddenly started to burn his first career, which was writing theater pieces, dramas. And even in the, in the Renaissance time, you find interpretations of Plato where they say he is a theater writer. When he speaks about dialogue as a principle, he could write philosophical texts in that way because before he has been an artist and he was doing art. So how can we, I can speak about Plato only as a philosopher seriously taken today when I speak in the language we now understand to be philosophical. But Plato, you know when I say Plato now, I had this not in mind, this man now, he is really the father, he is the grandfather, one could even say, of European philosophy. But this is what I mean, we do not respect and take seriously enough in the academic field our tradition of philosophy. What did Diogenes do? He was living in a box. So, you know, it would be incredible if I would now say I am coming here with a box and I did this in India three months ago with an Amadi. We made a Diogenes scene. Yeah? So he was going into the box. So that is classical mainstream European tradition. Who can be more classical than quoting Plato as a philosopher? See, in Whitehead, in the 20th century, one very important process philosopher says, the best way to define the European tradition of philosophy is to call it a footnote, a, 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 a footnote of Plato. 
So I'm not speaking, I have here a mainstream thinking when I say if there is one person in the European, one philosopher who is really giving the canon, it is Plato, but he was an artist. So why do we not express, and why I am not in, uh, allowed to take him seriously that he has been an artist? So then I'm speaking now exactly what happened with me when I started being in that elite uh, way of uh, doing philosophy and suddenly said, this does not work in intercultural philosophy. Why? Because I said already, in our tradition, Plato was a theater writer, Diogenes was living in a box, Montaigne wrote essays, Nietzsche wrote aphorism, but today, academic philosophy has a very narrow, especially if it's analytical, it has a very narrow thing of what is where you are allowed to call something philosophy. How can I do intercultural philosophy with such a picture in mind? That's abusing from the very beginning. Because the whole traditions where I'm going, they would, what they are doing, I have to say, oh, you are not doing serious philosophy. You are not, because as Wittgenstein says, we are captured from an image. And we don't see that that image is not the image, but it is culturally, historically shaped. But it's in our neck. And then also there are very pragmatical reasons if you want to have a career. You should also stick to that period. But that means that it is impossible simple. For example, I'm specialized also in Indian philosophy, and I'm uh, several months, uh, usually every year there. Uh, you know, when I look at them, they have the same tradition as I was quoting in Europe. Because when I speak of serious philosophy, usually in a classical Indian tradition, one does pre-think practice. This is not esoteric. They were in Greek peripatetica, yeah? So they were walking, and they had walking meditation. So we all exclude this way of thinking. And then we create a problem of how can I speak or relate to other philosophers, and I used the word other philosophers Syria, not only others who are doing the same as I do, but really making clear that I am now confronted with a real difference because he is doing breathing. So how, about, how shall I handle that? I can say like Hegel or this kind of philosopher, yeah, okay, these are primitive or not serious. That is Nietzsche said it already. Uh, that is the... Uh, so-called unserious way of doing philosophy, yeah? So, uh, yeah, that's our all part, but it's very clear that this is a colonialistic way of thinking. It's, I'm not just speaking as a philosopher. So I'm, I'm captured in the back from a disciplined picture of what philosophy means, yeah? The background knowledge of Wittgenstein, which keeps me caught because I cannot see anything else anymore. And really, if I would be a philosopher there, I would have to start with the deconstruction of these pictures where I'm, in order to create the openness to be able to relate to others. And not only go into a globalist, how does this work today? Look, when I go to Delhi or Mumbai or Tata Institute in Mumbai, you know, I will have no problem with my picture because they are globalized. You know? So they will do exactly the same as you would do here in Berlin or in Vienna or anywhere else. But that is exactly a big problem of interculturality. These are the big, big the well-educated people the, who are looking MTV and for whom MTV is made, yeah? and who are not really culturally different anymore. So if I go to them, then I say, look, what Berler told me here in Berlin is stupid because they do philosophy, they read Wittgenstein, and they do. Who here in this room knows, uh, for example, uh, Shankara, the most important philosopher classical of Indian tradition? Does anybody, does anybody know Abhivina Gupta? I'm quite sure that nobody has ever heard of him. Usually, uh, yeah, probably you. <laughs> but, no, but they know. If I go to Tata Institute, they know Wittgenstein. They have read Kant. 
But nobody here thinks that it is worse to read Abhivina Gupta. I have, a, a, in, in Vienna, since we have a focus on intercultural philosophy, I can do it. I have a form on the philosophy of tantrism. And also the student, hmm? the student's ladder. Yes, yes, sure. <laughs> so, so that was the first thing which brought me into a conflict. That I saw uh, this way as I was trained 20 years, that's simply not work on an intercultural. It does, I can only become a colonist. <laughs> and I was not so much interested in that uh, behavior or that job. So we started, how, how could we start to begin to deconstruct the way I have been disciplined for such a long time? So the first idea was that I'm now, for example, walking with this uh, thing, because it became clear that when you are in this kind of Christian teaching situation, you know, there's, you can be in a very critical and read Adorno, for example. But you are still you are standing like a, a priest in a Christian church. So where is the critique going on on the material circumstances in which you are? So you criticize critically and say Adorno and Horkheimer, but you are still standing here like being in a church and not in any temple, also in a Christian church. So why, so that was the beginning of what, why is art and philosophy important for intercultural diplomacy? That was the title. That I said, you know, they are always, and there comes Marx and that, that, that but they, what they are practicing in their bodily practice is so that exactly they are so critical, they even Adorno and, and sort of an, uh, aesthetics, but in the aesthetics they perform bodily on stage. They are so stereotyped that they don't have even the eye to see that they just do secular rituals. They just reproduce, reproduce on bodily a ritual, but will always say, you know, I'm against rituals but they are blind that they are producing the ritual bodily on the stage they are. The way how they read their text, the way how they stand, the way that they, nobody takes a thing or goes into the room. Yeah? So when I became aware about that way that philosophy, and I learned it from other cultures, I would not have that I if I would not do intercultural philosophy. So, the first thing what I learned is that they can really teach me something. They can teach me something, and not only in theory, but they got, gave me that eye that if you go not to Tata Institute in Mumbai, an elite uni university, uh, where I'm also in contact, yeah, but if I go to the uh, philosophers who are still in the local areas, but in the tradition of their own country and not the globalized one, then I will see that the people think they are very seriously, and that's not religion only. This is not only that these are religious men, these are philosophers because as the term came up, because not only in Greek, also in many other cultures, philosophy has primarily been interpreted as a way of living. So it's not only a question of religion, but it's much more a question of religion. So the way they are living is in a certain way honored and respected. But then, for example, they did breathing technique, and they said, you know, in order to think, in order to think what I want to think, I have to do that technique in the way that we are used to write. And in the process of writing, many people, would, we find the song. Yeah, in a certain way. Other people do it in walking, like Nietzsche or Wittgenstein. They walk and have always something in the pocket to read, uh, to write down. And then in a certain way, through walking, they and <laughs> So the, in a certain way, that thought comes. And it comes not independently of your bodily behavior. That we cannot understand that has again a lot to do with Plato and that tradition in which we are standing. 
because in a sense, Nietzsche was probably the first who really, he was an educated philologist, so his profession was not a from the professional philosopher, but a philolo classical philologist. So he was used to read these texts, these Greek texts, uh, originally. And what he thought is that there is something, for example, in the Western culture of philosophy where we are bind is, and that is exactly what I'm telling now, is that since Plato and so-called idealism, and even if we call us realists, in the praxis we are idealists, because we are just doing these things for, like, we speak of dialogue without entering any dialogue. Yeah? Or we speak of translating culture without translating culture. And so, uh, so uh, that is something which I suddenly learned to understand that through intercultural philosophy, that process gave me, as a European, a new way of thinking. It's not just that I came with my fixed idea, but I saw that in a certain way I have, through the process of that interrelationship or intersubjectivity or however you mean, intercultural, through that process, a new understanding of myself, of what it means to think, came into mind. And it would never have come into mind without going into that process. So it's not just that I come with a ready-made idea, but otherwise, the ideas are generated in a certain, I spoke of Whitehead already today, uh, important process philosopher, uh, that their ideas come out of the circumstances in which we are. And again, I would say Plato is the best. <laughs> Nobody reads it. Uh, Buchner from Harvard, he wrote a nice book. Uh, the, uh, the ideas, the drama of ideas, uh, uh, which won a prize in uh, 2013, club, where he said, you know, uh, why, in a certain way, is Plato not thinking of abstract ideas in the Platonic heaven? If that would be the case, why did he always tell where he got that idea? Why did he always, as a seer to make it tell, you know, I was walking through the marketplace, and then I met somebody, and there we started. A, he's the anti-Platonist. Because he always tells you, you have to think your ideas in situations. They are not coming, as is usually said, simply from the platonic heaven, but they are generated out of situations in which we relate. Yeah? So they are not a priori, but in a certain they are a posture. They come out of that relationship and are not just given uh, in that way. Otherwise, it would not at all make why he starts to tell that he's in the front of the Athens uh, walls of the city of Athens or within or, or thing. So that is the thing where we started. And now, yeah, I have to go on with, the, with the, what I wanted to say then. So that was the beginning. So then we ask, what, who are the experts of these things? Who who would immediately think that, how is the light here? Uh, Shell, is this a good place to talk about diplomacy? Or is it better to walk through or sit down? Who are the experts of that? And our idea was, the artists are. Certain artists are. Theater maker, for example, like Plato himself. Or other. If I want to change my, my picture of thinking, and see that these things which have usually be excluded of being not significant of what I'm thinking, and if I would like to bring them back, why do I not interrelate with artists who have a special expertise in these things? Theater maker, lab maker, uh, painters. They will always immediately say, you know, uh, I have to bring my hand into something. Yeah? I have to, uh, I have in a certain way to touch it. For us, who would say touch? No philosopher who is really trained, a philosopher said, that gives me a very, really important experience. But if you are working with artists, it's very clear. 
So what we then started is what we called arts-based philosophy, which is, meanwhile has had huge, which is founded always from the Austrian Science Fund, which is important, not from the Art Fund, uh, where we try to bring philosophers in contact, not only in the way, in the Hegelian aesthetic way, where then they say, you know, here are the, the, the artists, yeah, and I am the big philosopher, and I tell you what you are doing. <laughs> so in that way, you know, I have the concept. You are, yeah, you do it only, but I am your self-consciousness in a certain way, because I tell you what you are doing. And that does not work on an intercultural, and it does not even work on an interdisciplinary way. Who are that arrogant philosophers? who tell me what I'm as a painter doing. That is, again, we are not able to, the picture of philosophy which we had is not able really, we said it already many, to relate to otherness. Yeah? That is not really part because you said it beautiful and I really thought that uh, your talk was very brilliant and very nice, Isaac. Uh, in a certain way, it is so that uh, we, we really have to come out of that solipsistic picture or that monological way of doing philosophy and even writing in that way, uh, uh, pro probably books on the dialogue uh, of Plato. That is not, that is, so what we said is the body becomes important as being part of philosophy. Artists become important not only, and I liked also, I'm not criticizing and just telling our method, that not only that we are letting them play, but involving them into the process of thinking, because they have their ways of thinking. They have their ways even of doing research. I don't know whether people of you are in that discourse, but since there are doctoral uh, programs in Europe from the Euro UE, artistic research, research became a very important topic, just in the way to say what we are doing is research, but we do it another way, as you are doing. And when, when that, is, that is the thing, but are we still allowed? No, we are not allowed because the small word, you are not doing it, you are not serious. That is the, the, Nietzsche said it, you are only a so-called philosopher, but not the real one. Uh, that is exactly the formulation Nietzsche already used in the 19th century. Yeah? Also that is the thing, so we started to develop a format which is called philosophy on stage. And there, from the very beginning, we ask research questions we are in a certain way philosophers, scientists, and artists from the very beginning develop not only the thesis together, but also the mode of presentation. So if I would now speak on um, Indian uh, culture of art, I would work with an artist together an Indian or a European artist or whatever, in order to develop in the mode I presented also that way of expression which is there. So I'm not only vergegenständlichen uh, uh, the arts, but I use them as part of the discipline to generate my thoughts. Yeah? So that is the very idea of what we call art-based philosophy. And to bring it to an end, I don't know how long I was speaking now, uh, but to come back, so we did this for 15 years. We developed that form and in several quite big research projects, all founded by the, I have to say, all founded by the science force. So they also already, the research did also accept what the philosophers in the department, I could not do that, these projects, in the department of my philosophy. That would, be, under the colleagues, this would not, they accept me now because I brought a lot of third funds. So I have now the respect and they are quite happy that I'm doing this. But uh, that is very important. It was, the, it was the research area where the experiment in a certain way is a big thing where you have to experiment and not just to know as a Hegelian self-consciousness who even knows everything. Uh, 
but there you have to exper experiment. And so there is an affinity for sure to the art. So why I'm telling you this also is, so it started all from my experience with intercultural philosophy. Then we started to develop these new forms. And now we have founded, uh, some years ago, a small research center in Tamil Nadu in India. So I'm mostly relating to India. Uh, in my uh, uh, intercultural, it's my field of intercultural philosophy, and for sure India has a huge tradition uh, in philosophy. Uh, and so there we are trying to do these formats now and adapt these formats also from an intercultural uh, perspective there out of the European area. So what we are trying, what we are interested in is we have a, a WADI program. So usually six researchers from the fields of art and philosophy come together and we work with them for three months. Uh, on a research philosophical <laughs> topic and research question, and then develop with them together, uh, this is probably almost half Indian, half European, uh, and we develop with them together from the very beginning uh, answers to, uh, of, yeah, of, of a philosophy, uh, with Deleuze I would call it, we try to find solutions for philosophical problems, uh, but in a Deleuzean end of solution. That means that we try to find a way with the artists together from these different cultures and philosophers and thing, to develop ways of demonstrating that problem on all from on a bodily uh, aesthetic but also for sure in the classical way. So there will be where we for sure write texts, where we do classical uh, argumentation of philosophers. And with this, I try, this is the end, bring us back, for example, what, the, what philosophy meant in the Indian context always. To develop a life form that is not only, but for sure, all taking place discursively in texts, in writing texts, in discussing texts, in arguing texts, but much further also is a way of no, uh, no cultivating you not only on the discursive, but even on the bodily level. And the expert of that cultivation for me are the artist, yeah? So it is going back into the box of the organist in a certain way uh, and creating these things together. Also, for last, maybe the last point, which I wanna, spoke also already too long. Uh, the last thing which I would say is that what happens there also, ideology comes a lot from creating concepts which are not grounded in an earthly experience. Yeah, and that is also in a certain way interpretation of Hannah Arendt. Uh, that one can say, you are creating concepts which at the end do not touch real problems uh, there. So when we develop answers on philosophical questions over three months together in this team, where we are living together, where we uh, do create uh, ways of demonstration and creating source, then in a certain way, in an intercultural community, then these answers are growing out of an earthly milieu. And so they are still in a certain way in touch with problems which you experience there bodily also. Yeah? Or say with no see problems toward which you are bodily exposed. Yeah? And in that way, it's also essential, or in the broadest sense, an aesthetic, aesthetic uh, experience. And I think this is very, you had it in your title also, uh, sort of saying, to become global, you have to be grounded in local practices of your body and of the way uh, to, to relate to others. Yeah? And otherwise, we are always in the danger to create ideologies. 
we can start to create very complex systems which are no more, and Nietzsche said it's so beautiful in the task box, no more grounded in the truth of the earth. And that is also a very big political problem, I would say, because that creates also the big uh, distinction between the elites then and the people who think they are no more uh, represented in a certain way, or even seen by the discourses which are created uh, there. Okay, I think, I hope I have given you a, only a small impression uh, of this uh, intention and project which we are, which was born out of intercultural and landed again in an intercultural project through this uh, research project which we are doing there in India. And we are just also developing some small festivals in India where all these things then are also shown to the local people so that a, new, a mediation of that discourse already takes place in touch with the people there, you know? <laughs> it's not only shown at universities uh, or so, but it, the, what we are creating then and that philosophy starts to create a dialogue with the people there, yeah, uh, in the environment. Okay, thank you. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we've heard a, a real, real life example of how um, cultural exchange or cultural exchange based on understanding and knowledge might be. And now we'd like to maybe, um, with the inspiration of this lecture, to start um, start the dialogue from out of the audience. So if you have any statement, questions, or anything, thoughts, we just can keep the dialogue here. bringing Platonism into uh, talking about Platonism and how philosophy should be seen as continuous with, with what Plato did. And I wonder whether that is a, a good idea in the sense that Aristotle could be maybe, maybe considered the father of physics, and I don't think anything that physics does nowadays has any kind of continuity with, with Aristotle. So in the same way, uh, as physics doesn't have to pay homage to what Aristotle um, thought about, I don't know, the way the Earth and this, the stars move around. I don't know if there should be a strong case for there being a similar analogy between what Plato did and what I don't know, Wittgenstein does, or like other philosophy, philosophical traditions do nowadays. Yeah, I think this is a very good question what you're posing. Uh, in a certain way, I would say studying Plato is today something so that I better understand to need for a new image of doing philosophy. Many contempt several contemporary philosophers since the 20th century, suddenly, even before 19th century, started to call precisely or to characterize their own philosophy as reversal of Platonism. Yeah? That became a very important phrase, not only for Nietzsche, for Deleuze and many philosophers of many others of the 20th century. But that is exactly uh, where I would say, you know, in a certain way you are right. You would not need Plato, but you can only understand the revolution that is going on if you know him. That is what, and revolution mm -hmm. in, the, in the literal sense of revolting, that means subverting something. Yeah, that you invert in a certain way, Plato. Yeah? And you can only understand that revolting moment when you know Plato. The same like in physics, you know, only when you know the physics before the Newton's, phys Newton's physics, then you can really understand, or, Pla or Aristotle, as you said, then you can really understand the revolution that took place. But in a certain way, uh, it would be also possible to, uh, to, to do only modern physics. But what helps you to study, I'm very much uh, a fan of doing history of philosophy. Uh, in the right <coughs> way, not as a history of, of ideas, but in a Wittgensteinian sense, in the way that how can I understand from which 
solve patterns of Platon, I am personally culturally shaped. You know, you cannot say Plato lived 2,000 years, uh, more than 2,000 years ago. Maybe you can say it, but that's not very philosophically interesting. Much more interesting is that Plato generated a way of build thinking, an image of thought. And that image of thought has been 2,000 years probably one of the most powerful thought pattern that has culturally been transferred to us. So don't think that you are free from Plato. Even if you have never read Plato, it's in your neck. And so that means also that reading Plato is, like he said, beautifully also learning to know who you are. Because that 2,000 years of cultural history of shaping your spirit, in Hegelian, in a Hegelian sense, guys, uh, that is something which, in the, in the grip of his hand, we are all here, even if you have not even read one word of play. But the way he thinks has been developed for 2000. And not even in Germany, especially, where you have German idealism. Yeah? They don't call themselves only idealism, but they have a new, another for sure, but still own Plato related idea. From the idea. They have another idea from the idea. But they, in a certain way, have thought as they express it Plato to the end <laughs> in a certain way. Uh, so they did not only repeat him, but even fulfill him. And so, yeah, I don't know uh, who is in charge here for the <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have an online idea about the we you are referring to. Either in Vienna or Oh, we, now I'm in the lucky position that my wife, she's an actor and professor at the Max Reinhardt Seminar, mm -hmm. University for Music and Performing Arts. So we are working, we have developed together uh, these formats. So I was in the lucky position that I had uh, a book theater actress <laughs> at my uh, near, near me, nearby to me, and so we could, and she studied philosophy also, and so she has a PhD in philosophy, so she's very interested, was always very interested in philosophy. So what happened is that there, in Vienna now, philosophy and French is amazing. So in the art scene, that we, because we have festivals, we have, the last festival we had 1,500 people. But we are doing not popular thing as we hope, uh, but we are really trying to do uh, serious philosophy in a way as we understand it. So it is not a mass event, uh, but it is it, the last festival at Transport in Vienna. We had to close the doors because we have already too much, and that's a big call. Uh, we have to, we had more people who wanted to come in than were allowed. So uh, that is. That also shows that there is a, a certain way of need also for, for this kind of thing. And it's mainly similar, since I know the European scene, especially I'm now starting to understand also the Indian scene. Uh, in Europe and Canada, for example, these initiatives go on. Probably the biggest in this way is from uh, Eric Manning and Brian Masumi, the science lab in Montreal. But I think we have been already almost the second. I would say the, the second. Just the two? Or the no, other in joining. the last festival, 60 philosophers and artists were developing for one year their contribution. So the way, usually they, we start to work with them over several days in the workshops at Tanzberg. So the last event, Philosophy on the Stretch, was a big one, the last big one. Uh, there we, we work with them in workshops uh, three times. So there will be, then they go, they come again, they go, they come again. And then we show these things. And the last festival there were more than 60 
cancer patients over four days. So we are already a quite big we. And, but there again, there is from the Austrian Academy of Science in Prague, Alice Kobova. She's doing uh, also, so we are completely a research network. There is Laura Kahl in uh, Sari, London. Uh, there, they have a, a, a peer review journal. We will give out, I will give out from my own research project in December, the next issue. So there exists everything so called scientific. You can go to performance philosophy in University Sari. And there you will find there is a book series, there is a journal, there is SAR, the Society for Artistic Research, uh, which is a huge network which is uh, connecting uh, most art universities, uh, the big art universities in Europe, and so on. So, so we are, I was now speaking about our project here, but there exists a field of research. So, it exploded since 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a very, very simple question. I don't know if simple or naive, but I have a, a history of art and art critic background. Yeah. And, uh, I always looked at art production as as a non-verbal or verbal sometimes production of philosophy. So uh, uh, through your experience dealing with both philosophers and artists, do you think that artist looks like a philosopher that produces philosophy with a non-verbal way, or is it philosophers who are artists? that lack the technique, so they write their art through words. I, I'm always into this in my mind, and I never find it out. So this is the first time talking about philosophy. Uh, sure, these are questions I am uh, confronted all the time, also practical. Uh, but I would not use the word, for me, I would not use the word they are doing philosophy. That is not what I would call, they have their way of thinking. That is something I would say. They have their own idea, not not thinking. So it's not that the hair philosopher has the copyright for the word thinking, you know, and the only one who really thinks uh, is the philosopher. And Heidegger is the best example, yeah, when you have been uh, sort of saying there is only Hegel in a certain way, for sure, also. But I would say that these are. For me, non-acceptable pictures anymore of thinking. Uh, I think philosophers have their another way. They are not the same, but they have another way of thinking than, for example, artists do. And but what we are doing is not only that we cooperate with them, but what we are doing is bringing them together in order to answer a research question philosophical problem. And then it becomes interesting, even as the, the last problem which we had at philosophy was, uh, the, that's obvious, So, uh, but we have others also, we have also, right, can we? The last problem was, what means Nietzsche's concept of the artist philosopher? Yeah? So, so is that Nietzsche in a certain way developed already or seen uh, that kind of bringing together art and and in which way? Because he, especially late Nietzsche, the counter absolutely one. So he did not only obviously mean uh, the Gesamtkunstwerk or something, but what is the difference? Yeah. So we tried to find that out, and because we thought that's an interesting research question for philosophers, and it's an interesting <laughs> research question for for the, the best thing for us would be that, the, like I said, with the intercultural philosophy. Uh, the best way it would really be a lucky constellation if at the end of the project the philosopher would get another picture of what thinking is and the artist another idea of what art is. Yeah? So that, is, that would be the, the ideal, 
I don't believe in ideas, so that never happens, as with the definition of an idea, it does <laughs> never happen. So, uh, but that would, in a certain way, a regulative idea, everyone can, but that's stupid. No? We are not really working towards all this. Uh, but it is something which happens after. Yeah, let's say it. Sometimes it happens that after the project, the philosopher, woman or man, says uh, that something changed. So we are not in the identity philosophy. It's not so that I was the winner like Socrates. Yeah? So I had an idea and I was able to defend it. And so at the end, I was the best of all of them. And that's exactly a very dangerous picture, also politically. Maybe there, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. What would interest me is yeah, the kind of uh, questions and remarks from the other. I just wanted to ask you if it isn't, isn't it, wouldn't it be consequent to let go all these concepts of not impact? I think where the sense in saying I am a philosopher or I do it as a philosopher and they do it as artists. Wouldn't it be consequent to let all these uh, stereotypes go and not have any concept? Because it's just different, uh, different concepts of yeah. Well, we, we all think differently and we all make differently. So uh, would, this is a serious question. And, uh, another another question was um, you, you said about the way of speaking from there is like a religious, it's like a you know, it's like a religious art. But distinguishing be what, between them, the philosophers so who think who seem to be the serious philosophers, and we who are the serious philosophers because we all we do it in a different way, isn't it also a religious religious category? Isn't it also a religious behavior? This kind of speaking about those academic philosophers, those who are who think to be the serious philosophers, but we, the bad guys and the good guys. Isn't it, isn't it also? Yeah, sure, up to a certain degree, in a certain development, so a you have to, you, you know, two things. So that the, these are very important questions, which also are not easy to answer also. But only from our intention, we want to be serious philosophers. So I still love philosophy and doing also classical philosophy. So. Creating concept, as I would call it with the earth, is for me, I say it drops the job of philosophy. So that means uh, that we cannot escape and we don't want to escape distinguishing between things. We don't want to, uh, to escape the concept. But we have another concept of the concept. We have another concept of the concepts. We don't think that the concept, in a reversal of Plato, in a certain way, concepts are created immanently out of processes. And they are not in any way abstract power in that big thing. They are always abstraction from the process, which is because they immediately, every sign has a repeat, repeatability, iterability in it, and so on. So we cannot escape, and we don't want to escape, to hold the whole of philosophy away. But what we say is, we want to create, and that is pleasurable, for sure. <laughs> As also, for sure, a kind of nice uh, subversive moment, also, in me, that we say, uh, we, we, we are not only theorizing of uh, thinking it would be nice to create another uh, idea or concept of philosophy, but we are trying through these processes to create them indeed. So distinguish or not saying, so everybody, artists are doing the same as philosophers, that would not at all be, I am interested. No, I want to make a distinction that they should work in another regime. Then, uh, then and the very moment where that other regime is not only anymore the hegemonia who defines what philosophy is, I can lose that kind of rivality immediately. But that is always, you know, if something is coming from, from outside of the accepted standard, then it always has to defend itself first against the hegemonial structure. 
So that is okay for me, but it's not important because as, as uh, which is that uh, I'm not thinking dialectic. Dialectical would mean that I am defining what I am doing by that standard, but that's exactly what I am not doing. Sometimes I allude to that standard, but uh, I'm not, it's not a primary motive to be against that. So I'm not in the circle of negation of negation, but in the circle of productivity. I do it and I produce other codes in doing it. And they, by creating them, will be subversive for, for the other existing codes. But I'm not so much interested in, in that subversive aspect against them. No, they are always invited to come. <laughs> so, so that is not the thing. But the, the image from where thoughts are generated, uh, what sense they make, this started to change. And that is where I'm, in. I'm more in, interested in transformation than in having an abstract uh, definition. But wouldn't you say that, um, I mean, to talk about swimming, and swimming is, is a good thing. So um, probably philosophy exists only in philosophizing. In the moment we do it, it doesn't, so is, is it more, is it, is it uh, nearer to what you, what you say about the process? Yeah, for sure. In a certain way, that's the sort of immanence, you know, with Spinoza and, and uh, Deleuze and so many, that in a certain way, what swimming is, so as Heidegger says, you're looking to the Heidegger, no, 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 is no. something also I know by doing it in a certain way. And in that way, philosophy becomes a practice. Much more, because you know, it's not that we are a philosopher for me is not doing theory, he is practicing thinking. And in practicing thinking, like Fichte says, you know, it is sad. you cannot say, uh, I think for you, as Fichte says always in the beginning of his lectures, uh, courses, but it's I want to bring you to think yourself. And in that way, uh, thinking is much more for me, or became much more for me, uh, some, a praxis uh, in which you, uh, I think the Deleuze is the best definition for me. Uh, it is a praxis in which you create concepts. And that is the special thing of philosophy. And this is why we need distinctions and all these things, because we can also not escape from the rules of language. So, so if, if I say something, uh, then I say also what you uh, say. And so in a certain way, that is, but I don't see the big problematic things. We don't want, we want to do, this is why I still would call what we are doing is not art, so, but philosophy. Yeah. Because we are very interested in making this distinction and accepting, accepting this thing. But what we implemented is, that in a certain way, uh, it does not end. Uh, it's it's giving back the material conditions and the body to the philosophers, which has been, in my experience, been excluded in the rituals of the academy, even if they speak about it. But what they perform is forgetting, and they forget. Who was now, I would say, not as, as a critic, but who was thinking when we coming into this room about the light situation? Who was thinking about this? Every artist would do it immediately. This would be one of the first thoughts which he or she would have. Mm -hmm. But we know Why? Because we have been disciplined that that is irrelevant. So what we are interested in is much more to bring that in. And if you go to other cultures, I see that in other cultures, this has not in the same way been excluded. It is, or I go to the globalized Europe, sort of colonialistic level, where it's also certainly the European practice has been uh, universalized. Yeah, I find it all then in China, in Japan, and in India, everywhere. First, uh, close to the captain. You had to raise your hand? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> go, go first. I like very much this um, blind people and the elephant. And I think we have to see where, in blind spotting, where are the empty spots. And I think I heard here a lot 
about symbols, I heard here a lot about concepts, but the percepts, what the artists are doing. So how can we include fields, senses, all these other kinds of intelligences? And to look a little bit in what you do, I wonder if you should not also include architects into people doing arts. Because when you, for example, go to Sanssouci, you see the exact and the fine arts. They have to merge architecture and astronomy, sculpture and painting, that we have to really come to other ways of cultural expression. I try to take Plato seriously as a thing and say, you know, I need Achim. We are working with Hans Hofer since 15 years. He's a big uh, museum architect in uh, Vienna, and uh, he is one of the E's even in the, in the, in the narrowest team. So he's not even in a, in a special position in, in respect to all others. Because that is what I have learned. When you do these things, you first have to think of the room. Whether something works or not has a lot to do with the room and the room. Yeah? And whether that room fits to what you intend to do or not. This is why the architect has the priority in the reality uh, in outfit. Because first we, we think which rooms would fit and then we prepares that room. Uh, that is uh, that is always the beginning of every project. First thing is whether we find the room where we think that it will work. Okay, the architect would never use such a map. It is absolutely distorted, it's not equal area. It is our mind box, our mind bugs which make this diplomacy and such representations without any fidelity come into the Mindset yeah, I modern think, Here I would not agree. I think this is a nice thing because it's an artwork. It's an artwork. Yeah. So it is an artwork where you have exactly that shift from the politics to the poetic. <laughs> this is an art. It's an artwork. Yeah, it's an artwork, uh, and you have there the shift from the politic to the poetic. Yeah, just two brief uh, uh, observations. I, I, I don't have a question. The first one is usually, um, you said who, who thought about the, the light, and that, that to be fair, you people who thought about the light, me who about the light. <laughs> just to give you the credit. Mm -hmm. And also about the sounds we, we thought. Yeah. We talked. So the better. So that's maybe because he. The he, better. That is nice. <laughs> 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 I don't it's not a joke or a compliment. I think that is that is important. It's important. It is absolutely it's not it's absolutely. Um, no, the the very brief observation is just um, taking in also what you what you can say. I think one aspect of Many, if not all, the talks which comes out, I don't know if you agree, is that uh, it's just one aspect, but I think an important one um, is that the what we call the Western tradition is in a moment in which it feels trapped and uh, it's looking for a way out. And these are moments in which they're critical moments, uh, and while while somebody's looking for when somebody keeps track and is looking for a way out, many things can happen in, in either ways. And I just think that, um, I don't know, to be a citizen of our world, whether one belongs to this tradition or whether one does not belong to this tradition, it's, it's good to know that this is happening, just simply for the fact that this tradition has taken possession of the entire globe. I mean, with everybody. Yeah. So to know that what it has taken possession of the entire globe through the, its outcomes uh, is is feeling trapped and uh, can that, for instance, be sort of very destructive. It's a good thing to know to be a citizen of our world. Thank you. I'm sorry, but the my original art one moment, you have, is there something here I did not see because you were... 
Philosopher, I had to think what happens when Kant would read Nietzsche. Yeah? What would happen with Kant when he would read Nietzsche? I, my interpretation was he would land on Freud's couch. <laughs> because he would have some brain being traumatized. <laughs> so I was lying in, even in a classical costume on Freud's couch, and my wife. The actress, she was Lou Salome, you know, she was uh, indeed also a friend of Fahr uh, in the inner circle, and she had the first psychiatric, uh, uh, psychoanalytical uh, praxis in Göttingen. And so we take these things, yeah, and for sure, but it, it makes a freedom. I cannot do that seriously as when I teach 
at the philosophy department, yeah? And in that way, it's relieving because I can suddenly do. But is that not something where, so for, also even for the audience and the students, uh, which many of them are on the festival always, do they not learn, probably when I'm doing it good, more or other things of Kant and Nietzsche and the conflict which then, <laughs> if I am a Kant on the couch and have a conflict and go to Lou Salome, she should give me a therapy and start to defend my philosophy against uh, certain Nietzsche arguments. Yeah? And so, so that is, but I would never call me there an artist. You know, I'm a philosopher who takes the freedom to go in, to make things possible which would not be possible as long as I would accept the classical standards of the definition of what a philosopher does do. Now, I write also many text classical, so that's not the thing, I have no problem. I like that, I would not like to be always on the couch. Yeah. So, but that was one thing. But other contributions are, for example, Barbara Krauss, I mentioned her, she was she's a performance dancer and she is uh, doing a kind of renaissance way of buffosing yeah where she is going through the audience and by asking them certain questions which are quotes from Nietzsche and starting to develop a, a contact with the audience through this but that means for example she would say something like oh this is not the right chair situation. So, could you please take your chairs, bring them uh, there, uh, let's find a place here somewhere, and suddenly everybody would start to no, thank you. change the room. <laughs> we are doing this uh, here too much. <laughs> Moving chairs and tables, we have enough. <laughs> so that would be the assistance already from the, this is why you have to have the right place to do this. But that would mean that she, you learn to know, look, these people, they do, I, I don't think that you are Nietzsche expert, or you know a lot about the, uh, the artist-philosopher concept from Nietzsche. So she would go through, but she, that is an artwork. You know, nobody, there are not so many people even in Berlin who can do that on that level of quality, what she's doing. And also in Vienna, nobody else than Barbara can do that. Yeah? So that is not, these are not only, I have an idea, these are professionals. And she will start to have, she has, she read text, we had reading circles with her, and like the other things, she takes a quote, there are something she can relate to, and starts to have an idea how to create that in a performance. Yeah? I said, this is the way how you have to, to think. We don't want to make her a philosopher. That would be stupid. And she has to tell you now this. But she will have her own way in her medium to respond to that philosopher. And suddenly you will see that probably some people understand something from Nietzsche which they would never understand when we, in our form, would speak of them. For example, one performance I can really recommend is the Russell, the opening performance between Dieter Nersch, a philosopher uh, teaching in Switzerland, and the painter Nikolaus Kanzler. While Nersch was having his classical thing, there are all forms possible in the net, and we have to find them out what fits for this performance. Uh, so, uh, Mersch reads a text on the concept of Dionysus from Nietzsche and a very great artistic research uh, painter, Nicholas Ganster, is starting to develop diagrams through listening and reading that text. And I think this was very, really, very beautiful. One can even a little bit see in the, in the video that really he's, he's, he became, he's in many galleries all over Europe now, and he developed a way to create artistic diagrams. The diagram is so important in, in, in science. 
but he tries to develop a form of artistic diagrams responding to uh, philosophical things. And when I, after that performance, that's Russell, but I went down and I, a friend of mine, uh, she, she knocked me uh, on the shoulder and said, no, after seeing this, I, I know she read Nietzsche, for Katra, she said, it was the first time I saw and understood what the deal is, in the way how he goes into the black and then finds in the paper a drive, you know, a paper that has written drive and he puts it out of the black. It's a, and that is not just his transferring or illustrating the speech, but he's making an art out of that speech. So that would be so different example how we... Okay, but I think that's enough. <laughs>